All that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's good to be here uh, with you and with your people, with our family. We ask that you would meet us in this place, that our music and our just our attendance even is an acknowledgement of your goodness, an expression of worship and adoration to you, and would you receive it as such. I ask that you would have our hearts prepared for your word that is coming as we think about what it means to what it means for you to have a plan for our life and how integral that is to the restart and the renewal that I know we're all looking for. As Father, would you meet us in your word and speak to us from it? We ask that you would bless the work that we're doing in Northeast as we pour into students there and the teachers there, that your love would shine through us and it would open the door for gospel opportunities for our reading buddies and for our mentors that are going into the school, that you would use them to share the gospel in word and in deed. We ask your blessings on Aaron this morning, that you would give her a special dose of grace and of peace and of patience for the work that she does, and that through her, your love would be shown to the students that she cares for. Would you provide for her and protect her and her family as she works? Father, we look forward to our time in your word. Would you prepare our minds and our hearts for it? We ask that in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning that today is going to have a couple opportunities of call and response, all right? Meaning I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to look at you awkwardly because I actually want you to answer. It's going to have a, a touch of a feel like Wednesday nights, right? Where we may get to get a discussion and only because I think that's how the Lord may open some thoughts for us. I'm just warning you that's kind of out of the norm for Sunday morning, but I'm betting we can roll with it. Uh, I hope that you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. That's where our passage is going to be. Uh, you should have gotten an insert. Uh, hopefully I grabbed you as you came in uh, and that kind of provides uh, kind of an outline. We're doing a fill-in-the-blank thing for our September series, and I want you to be able to follow along. Then it's because what we're doing is we're looking at the elements needed for a restart, a renewal, a revival, whatever word you want to use. Restart's the one that I'm choosing to, to call it, is that thinking about how we may want to go in a new direction with our life. You may want to go in a new direction, obviously, in our church, and your family. You may be looking for the Lord to do something in you because you've been in a hard time or you've been in a struggle or whatever it is. And you're like, I, I just I need a fresh. I need something new. So we are looking at what those elements are, the things that need to be present for renewal and restart to happen in your life. Last week, we looked at God's character, all right? And if you missed that, go pick it up on YouTube. It's there. You can fill in the blanks on your own, right? But we looked about God's character, and that's obviously where it has to start. If anything good is going to come in your life, if anything new is going to come in your life, if any form of restart is going to happen in your life, it starts with who God is, all right? It starts with how good He is. It starts with His Hesed, we got to play around with that incredibly awesome word. His loving kindness and faithfulness to you. It begins there. Knowing who God is and what he wants for you brings us to element number two. And that's God's plan. What God wants to do in your life. The thoughts that he has for your life. The, the steps that he has lined out for you. The calling that he may have placed in your life. So to restart, you have to know that God has a plan for you. And that may be like, it's probably not a new idea. Because I know most of us have been in church and you've heard that at least at some point, right? But to think that God has a plan in your life. A purpose or a vocation for your life. And I even want to use the, the preachy, churchy word, calling. And it's important that you... You, you hear me say that. It's important to me, at least, that you dwell on it, that God has a calling on your life. Now, we mess this up. In the Baptist church, we mess this up a lot because we talk about callings, right? God put a calling on their life. I understand. All right. <laughs> Awesome. I'm tired of that? And when I put it on this morning, I thought, it's going to go off. And sure enough, it did. I'm just going to quit wearing it on Sundays. You know, it doesn't do that all week long. All week long, I'm like talking to it. It doesn't work. And then I get up here and it's just losing its mind. Where was I? Calling. All right. So like, I mean, this has been experienced in my life, right? God put a calling on my life and we understand that. All right. God set, sets him apart to do preaching or even to do deacon or whatever. And then we put him up here and we lay on the hands and we send him off to seminary. And that's what a calling means. And that is actually a terrible understanding of what calling is. 
calling is that God looks at you and says, I have a purpose for you. I have something laid out for you. There is a, a mission or at least a part of my overarching mission that I want you to play. And yes, for a couple of us, that means to go into some form of vocational work where you stand up here and do all this. Most of us know. Because the truth is, and this is actually really cool to think about, most actual ministry, most things that happen that bring the gospel to light and help spread the kingdom of God in the world don't happen from up here. And they don't happen by someone who has the calling and the right things hanging on the wall. That's not the job that God has placed on me. My job is the instigator, right? To the encourager. God puts a calling on all of our lives to be ministers of the gospel. To participate in the existence and the growth of his kingdom in your family, in your work circles, and whatever. So that God has a calling for you and that that is not just for preachers. That's not just for pastors. And that's one of the, the bad things that, that plays around in Baptist life. It's almost like a, it's like a heritage hanging over from our Catholic backgrounds, right? Of calling out priests and setting them up and making them important. And then we can say, well, God put a calling on their life and therefore I don't have to have a calling on my life. And it's an escapism. And we need to let that go. Because God has called you to something. He has given you purpose. He has given you vocation. He has something for you to do, a role for you to play in the unfolding of his kingdom and to bring the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to think about that. That's what we're going to spend the next 20, 30 minutes dwelling on, is that God has put callings on your life and on all of our lives. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And that thought then brings me to the church in Corinth. Now on Wednesday nights, we've been playing around with Corinth now for what seems like a year, right? So if you come on Wednesdays, you're going to, actually you'll hear a little bit of this. You've heard some of this before. But you think about the church in Corinth. So Paul writes first and second Corinthians and we know there's a third letter in there somewhere. He writes to them more than he writes to anywhere else. He spends more time there than he does with anywhere else because Corinth had problems, alright? If there was ever a church in bad need of a restart, it's the church in Corinth because they're having struggles, they're having failures, years. Let's just make sure we understand the context. This is what's happening in Corinth. They are arrogant. They have an air of superiority. There's a, a discrepancy in the, what's happening. You've got like the rich people in the church and then you've got the poor people in the church and they don't, they don't interact. They don't get along. So there's inequality there. There's some pretty radical sexual immorality that's happening within the church. They're abusing the Lord's Supper, which you would think would be pretty simple, right? Let's get together and share a cracker and some juice. And yet they somehow mess it up and abuse it and make it about haves and have nots because they're greedy there's an abundance of greed present in this church. They have problems with idolatry. The point is, like, Corinth has issues. This church there has issues. So they need a restart, a renewal, a revival. They are the ones, like the poster child in Scripture, of a church who needs God to breathe fresh life into them. And Paul uses the idea of God's calling in their life to help bring them back in line. All right? So that's where we're going to pick up in like the first part of 2 Corinthians is that Paul is trying to address them and bring them away from all that bad stuff we just recognized and get them back in the line of who they are and who God is wanting them to be. And he talks about the concept of calling to do it. So it raises the question, and this is like the question I want you to dwell on, is what is God's calling or what is God's plan for you? What's his plan for your life? Now that's going to start generic because it's going to be very similar for all of us. But as we go, I hope that you'll find a way to fine tune it to what he's saying to you specifically. We're going to look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, we're actually going to take it kind of verse by verse. I want you to start in verse 15. He says that Christ, you see it in verse 14, he talks about Christ's love, he compels us, and that Christ, in verse 15, died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So you think about, like, and this is fill in the blank number one, by the way, if you're following along, is God's plan or God's calling in your life is to live for him. All right? Now, this is one of those churchy questions, one of those churchy phrases that is beautiful and it means a lot if, if you have any concept of what it means means. And this is where participation starts. What in the world does that mean? You hear me say, like, you, you, the calling in your life means to live for Jesus, to live for Him. What does that mean? 
<laughs> Can anybody define that? I need to put me out of the way. Okay. So a, a removal of self, focus on something else. All right. Be like Christ. Huh? Be like Christ. Being like Christ. All right. So an emulation, following and obedience, like it. What else? We may have found something to work on, right? Like, and that, that's my point. Like, this is, and I guess just, you know, a lifetime in the church. Because you all know, I'm, I'm the son of a pastor, the grandson of a deacon. I've been in church longer than I've been alive, right? So this is one of those phrases I just, I hear. It's a part of my vocabulary. I'm going to live for Jesus. And then you got to stop. Thinking, I don't know what that means. We need to dwell on what it means, right, to live for Christ. And as a matter of fact, if you were to keep going, he says that in verse 16, that we live for him. But then you look in verse 16, he says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. It says that we changes, like living for Christ means it changes how we see other people, all right? So it's about, it's about focus. It's about thinking about what your primary goal is. And obviously the idea of, of, of death or sacrifice to self in order to recognize that he's more important and what he's called us to be is more important. But it's, it's, it's mission. It's goal-oriented, which is really helpful for a goal-oriented person like me, is that I live for, for him. Is that everything I do is in somehow beneficial for him. Everything that I do is somehow like for his purpose or for his service or whatever. You know, those of you who have raised a family have a really good understanding of that because you live for your children, right? Not fully, but you make decisions based on what's best for them, not necessarily best for you. That's a good way to start thinking about it. And that God's calling then on your life, it starts there, that we live for Him. But let's, let's keep going. We're going to let that unfold as we go out. So we see in verse 15 and 16, it says that we live for Him. But then you roll into, say, verse 17. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. All right, so thinking about what God's calling on your life is, it means to be in Christ. This is another one of those weird churchy kind of things, but I'm going to define this one for us. To be in Christ means to be protected protected, to be purchased, to be reconciled, to be incorporated into the body of Christ, to be somehow connected to Him. So that, that word in, that little preposition there actually carries all kinds of connotations of connectivity, related to merged together. It's actually kind of interesting because you think about Paul who writes this. He, he uses similar language in Romans. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5 he says to be united with Christ. It's the same kind of language but that word actually helps us get a better understanding because the word united is used to describe like a wound that is healed or a broken bone that's being fused. I think that helps us get a better understanding of what it means to be in Christ, to be fused together with Christ, to be so related with Him that it's hard to figure out where He stops and where I start because we're co-mingling. We are working and being fused together. It's the idea that things that are supposed to be together, like a bone, that have been torn apart and have now been put back together. That's what it means to be in Christ. We were ripped from Him. We were always supposed to be in Him. We are always supposed to be with Him. And we got ripped apart by our own stupidity. And He, in His grace, puts us back together. So think about like the idea of God's calling in your life. So we live for Him. This idea of like goal-oriented, somehow making everything that I do about Jesus. That I'm also in Jesus or in Christ, meaning that I'm related to Him and I'm reconnected to Him, which means that like I'm finding relationship and interaction with the divine being, which is pretty significant. But then he goes on to think about what it means to me. Like if I have been renewed, if I have been brought back in to Christ, if I am the broken bone that has been put back together, that means there's something new about me. Then he uses that kind of language in, in verse 17. He says, if anyone is in Christ, what did he say? The new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. You're a new creation. Meaning you've been renewed. You've been saved. This is the kind of language we use. You've been corrected. We don't like that word, but that's what it means. A new creation has been corrected. You've seen the waywardness of your sinful desires and ways, and God has brought you back in line. And I want you to think about, this is a rhetorical question, so don't jail this out because it'll get really awkward, right? 
but dwell on for a moment what changed in your life when you decided to follow Jesus. Because our theology, we see right here just a glimpse of a, a deeper theological truth is that when we start to follow Jesus, something changes within us because our identity changes. Like I become a new person, I become a new creation. All that kind of language we see in Scripture of, of newness and renewal means that something changed within you. Not in the way that you talk and live, and that all comes later, but something within you changed. And I want you to just take a second and, and think, like what was that? What changed in your heart, in your character, in your worldview, in your very definition of how you see yourself as person? What changed when you started following Jesus? I promise that something did. And if you can't remember what that was, you can't think about it, that becomes a great little homework opportunity for you this week. Is what changed in me? Now, for me, that's hard. i got to go back to seven years old, right? What changed in me is like, well, I don't know. I started wearing shoes to church, I guess. But something changed, right? Something changed in, in my identity. And I want you to think about it. Even if you have to go back to seven or eight, like that's a long way to go. But something has changed in your heart, in your character, in your worldview, because Jesus is now with you. Jesus is now in you. You were broken apart and have been fused back together with him and made you into a new creation. And you want to be able to think about that, identify it, dwell on it, and then build on this new creation that God has made you. So what does it mean to follow God's plan, know that He has a plan or a calling in your life. Well, you can see how we've got kind of generic -y church ideas, right? So we live for Him. We're in Christ. We're a new creation. And I hope you see it starting to funnel, right? Like that new creation becomes very much more specific because you're a new creation, not us. You are a new creation. And then we start getting into duties, purpose, the things that we were created to do. I want you to look in verse 18. Because so he said in verse 17, you know, this new creation is here, the old is gone, the new is here. Verse 18, now all of this is from God. So all of this, all these things that have come, all this newness that has happened is from God. And that in itself is pretty significant, right? That you didn't do this. You've not made this happen. Sure, you said the prayer, and I hope you did. 100%, you got baptized, and I hope you got done it right as a Baptist, right? Put down a shaking really good. You participated in all that, but don't fool yourself to think that you have done it, right? All of this is from God. God is the one who initiates it. God is the one who's making it happen. He is the one who wants it to happen. God is doing these things in and through and for us. So in verse 18, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So what is God's plan for your life? Well, it's going to be participating somehow in this ministry of reconciliation. He says he's given it to us. So this job, this purpose, this responsibility to take the broken and rebellious world, the bone that has been broken and the shard that is over here, to go in to bring that, find it, and bring it back to Christ to be fused and put back together. Like that job, that purpose has been given to us. It's, we're responsible for us. And in that he says that he's entrusted to us this message of reconciliation, which brings us to conversation point number two. What is the message of reconciliation? Because if you're going to understand the ministry of it, what it is we're supposed to be doing, you need to think about why and what it is that we're saying and talking about. So how would you define that? How would you define this message of reconciliation? What do you think? Okay, so some f forgiveness required or, or offered. I need it, and then I have to offer. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And but if you're going to talk about forgiveness, something's got to come before that, right? Like if I recognize that I need forgiveness, what's the step that comes before that? 
recognize that I messed up, right? I can't go ask Elizabeth for forgiveness for something stupid I said if I'm not willing to admit that what I said was stupid, all right? You'll see how that works? So, message of reconciliation, 100% requires forgiveness, the asking and the offering from God, but it also requires whatever comes before that, an acknowledgement of messed up. We use the word sin, but like that's it, an acknowledgement that I need. What else? What else is part of this message of reconciliation? I think if you're going to give a message to somebody, you've got to not tell them what they need to do. You need to tell them what I had to do. Okay. Telling your story, right? All right. Which would include, obviously, a recognition of wrong, asking and receiving a forgiveness, connection to or relationship to the source of forgiveness, which would be the Christ part, right? Yeah. Anybody else? So I hope you're seeing the pieces put together. That God has a plan for your life, right? He has a plan for our life 100%, right? But that that funnels in that God has a plan like for your life. His eye is really on the sparrow. There's a reason we sing that song today, right? Which means he has an eye on you. He knows you. He calls you by name. He's counted the hairs on your head. All those incredible things that talk about how significant you are to God and that he knows you individually, which means he has a calling and a plan for you individually. And I'm not 100% sure that that's like step by step, take A, B, or C, but I 100% know it's go this direction. I have something on the end that is for you that of course ends in salvation, but there's a path to be followed. There's a process to be done. There's something to do along the way. And that involves this ministry of reconciliation, this responsibility to be a part of him calling a rebellious world back to him, which includes then this message of reconciliation. The fancy word for that is gospel, right? To talk about how we are fallen, we're rebellious, we're in need of help, we're in need of forgiveness, and Jesus is the way and the place where that comes from. So I want you to think about, like, as you fill that blank, as ministry of reconciliation, we start to get much better definition of what God's plan is for our life. And what his calling is on your life, that you are part of a ministry, a life-giving, life-changing, world-defining ministry. Now that is purpose. That is vocation. It means that you have something to do. You have a mission to accomplish. You have something that you need to get done. And this is incredibly helpful because I want you to go back to where we started with last week is that we need renewal and usually renewal comes or is needed because what? We've, we've fallen. We've gotten hurt. The world has beaten us down. Whatever it is that caused you to go into the hole. Sometimes it's the world does that. Sometimes you do it. Sometimes it's just bad luck. That's the way it goes. But you're in a hole, right? You have fallen and you're wanting to get up and you're needing to get up. And I don't know about you, but this has been true for me always. Is that when I fall and I want to get up, I need a reason to get up. I need a reason not to just lay there on the ground because truth is it kind of feels good to lay down. Truth is, when I fall and get embarrassed, sometimes I just want to lay there in my embarrassment. I remember as a kid, like I was like fourth or fifth grade, me and a bunch of guys, we're running around the playground just being stupid, right? Chasing each other. It's rain. There's a lot of mud out here. And I went running around this big rock, right? And some, I'm chasing some kid. I don't know. And I was slow. I wasn't going to catch him. But I'm rounding the rock and my feet slipped in the mud. And I hit the ground. And in retrospect, I realized what I should have done is when I hit the ground, I should have popped right back up, right? And just like, okay. Okay, I'm fine. My knees got muddy. My elbow got muddy. Everything is fine. But no, David wanted to dwell on it for a second. So when I hit the ground, I just slid in it and then I rolled in it and then I just laid there, <laughs> dwelling on the fact that I'm now completely embarrassed and I've busted it. And I'm not just muddy on my elbows and my knees, there's mud in my eyeball, right? It's in my shoe. I'm head to toe covered. And I just wanted to lay there in the mud and kind of hope nobody noticed that David's disappeared behind the rock somewhere. I need a reason to get up when I fall down. And I think this is it. If you're in a hole, and whether you, it doesn't really matter why you got in the hole. But when you fall, to getting up is easier when you have a reason for it. And this is the reason is you have a job to do. 
You have a purpose. There is a mission that God has entrusted to you, and that is a calling that is defining on your very character and who you are. So I'm down here, and I'm hurt, and I'm beat up, and I'm embarrassed, and I, I just assume lay here, and God says, no, nah, you've got work to do, David. Take your breath and get up, and let's keep going. That's where this starts to play in, to me at least. As you think about God's calling to participate in this mission and ministry of reconciliation, and knowing that that then gives you a reason to get up and keep going, to start the next day, to keep fi- whatever it is, to get out of this hole, you now have a reason. Now add to that, and this is just going to be like a bloop, For those of you that have come on Wednesday nights, and I want you to see how this connects. Add to this that if God has called you, he says here, to this ministry of reconciliation, and he's entrusted to you this message of reconciliation. If you can remember all the way back in chapter 3, like 4, 5, and 6, he calls you a competent minister of the gospel of reconciliation. Not only has God given you this calling... And he's given you even the responsibility of participating in the ministry of reconciliation. He's made you competent to do it. He's given you all the tools necessary to accomplish it. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within you and gives you what you need to accomplish what God has called you to do. That's encouraging. That's a reason to get up. That's a reason to keep going. But let's play on that for a minute. If we are called to this ministry of reconciliation, and you are a competent minister of that ministry of reconciliation, what does that actually look like? We start fine-tuning, like narrowing our definition. Well, it starts, say, in verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were called, making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You need a job description? There's job description number one. You are ambassadors, meaning we represent God's mission to the world. You know what an ambassador is, right? Like an ambassador for the United States goes and lives somewhere else and speaks on our behalf to those people and to that government. That's us. We are citizens from a kingdom from another place sent to this world to speak our king's business to the world that we are in. So we are promoting God's reconciliation to a world who needs it, who needs to hear it and say, hey, there's something good for you. So you get to be an ambassador of God and of his kingdom to a world that desperately needs it. But that's not all. Keep going. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Verse 1, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, this one blows my mind. I love it. It's cool to have a job. It's cool to be a part of this ministry. It's cool to think that I get to be an ambassador for God. But the idea that I get to be a co-worker with God is mind-blowing to me. I'm an idiot. I'm just a small-minded country boy from Mississippi, and my world is this big. And God says, why don't you come work with me? You get to be a co-worker or a co-laborer if you're in the King James Version, right? You work hand in hand and side by side of the Almighty. That's just mind-blowing that we get to participate in God's mission in the world and get to do it right beside him, being his hands, being his feet. God's the one making it happen, but he does it through us. The honor, the honor to get to work with him in his ministry and his work and ultimately his reconciliation of all creation is mind-blowing. I don't deserve it. 100% don't deserve it. But he invites me to it. He invited you to it. He's entrusted it to you. Come and work with me. Not just as my ambassador, but as a co-worker. That's pretty cool. But there's one more. If you keep going, say in verse 2, he says, In the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of my salvation, I, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We, took, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. And here we are in verse 4. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every 
way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, distress, and beatings, imprisonments, and rides, and hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, and purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, and the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, and truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness, in the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report, good report, genuine, yet regarded as imposters, known, yet regarded as unknown, dying, yet we live on, beaten, yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Y'all hear that whole list? Like that's mind blowing. He's talking about difficulty. He's saying life is hard and all these kind of things have happened to me. And we know Paul's story and we understand it. But even in the midst of all that, we can then see ourselves as servants. That's the point in verse four. Servants to God, the almighty. We get to be his ambassador to the world. We get to be his co-laborer in the world. But then we also are called to be his servant submitting to God's mission for the world, willing to serve, willing to even sacrifice of self for the benefit of the other so that they can hear the message of reconciliation and be called back into salvation and rightness with God. You've heard the Bible story about being jars of clay, right? That's us. We're jars of clay and God can mold us how he wants and God can break us if he needs to. Either way, we trust him, right? Because he's God, and I'm not. I want you to think about like the common denominator that is present. And all these things, as we've taken this whole idea of being like in Christ, then we've funneled it down to being an ambassador and a co-laborer and a servant, that there's a common denominator that is present underneath and connecting all of those. And that is that you have a job to do. You have a responsibility and a mission to complete that is bigger than yourself. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than the problem that's right in front of you. It's bigger than everything that you can imagine. So, and to me, that doesn't overwhelm me. That encourages me that I get to be a part of something that is larger than me. So no matter what's happening, no matter what heartache no matter what difficulty, which is what verses 4 through 10 all are, right? No matter what happens here, hear the purpose and the mission you get to be a part of that is so much bigger than all of that. And keep going. Keep going. Because what you've been called to do has eternal matter and eternal significance. I want you to stop and think for a second the difference between a job and a vocation. This is kind of a new world for me, especially this whole do two job things. Like, and I've had to come to define the difference in the two. Can you think about the difference between a job and a vocation? A job is the thing that you do, right? Like I'll do it, I'll do my work, and then I'll move on. I'm actually looking forward to this new job that I'm about to have. I clock out at 2 o'clock, and at 2.01, I no longer care, right? I'm done until 6 o'clock the next day. Woohoo! That's going to be great. That's a job. You do the job, you do what you have to do, then you move on from it. But that's different than a vocation. A vocation is a calling. A vocation is defining to who you are. A vocation is how you introduce yourself, right? Vocation is bigger than just the work. It's something that I care about. It's something that I find identity in because it's a part of who I am, not just the thing I do during the day. I want you to hear that God's plan for your life, what God has called you to, is a vocation. It's not just a job. It's not something you go and do and, all right, I've done it. He has called you to this vocation, this ministry of reconciliation. And to me, I think that is then the inspiration for your restart. If you've been in a hole, you're in the hole, and you're like, God, I need renewal. I need a start over. I need something. I need something new. Well, we know his character and his willingness. And now we have our inspiration as to why we pursue it. Because God has called you to something that is identity defining, to the very heart of who you are. It's kind of the why between the what and the how of what we're wanting God to do in our life. God's calling on your life is to be a minister of the gospel of reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for this calling. 
My hope and my prayer is that we've been able to wrap our mind around it, identify it and define it, be inspired by it. Because I know when I am down, when I'm hurt, when I feel beat up, I, that's, I just need a reason. I need an inspiration to get up. And here it is. Is that you have called us to be a part of something that is bigger than us. And that is an honor and a responsibility. And it's defining to who we are. I ask that you would help each of us to to grasp and to absorb that truth of what it means to be a part of your ministry, that you would bring clarity to the roles each of us play in that ministry, and that we are active participants in your reconciliation of creation, that you would inspire us and use us in that purpose and for your glory. Would you take the next few minutes, please, and sink those thoughts into our minds and give us clarity about the next steps that are part of our life. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen.